Metro Exodus is one of the few games that had me totally immersed up until the very end, and during its final hour, I found myself forgetting I was actually holding onto my keyboard and mouse. I was running towards an objective that was very important to the character I was playing, and in a way me as well, since I had embraced the motivations of this particular protagonist. Essentially I was sprinting like hell, ignoring all the enemies I could, not picking up any items off the ground. No shiny things, no goodies, no nothing, and barely even stopping to heal. I even died a few times because of this. It's rare for a game to make me completely drop all the gameplay mechanics it has and just run towards a goal. Ignore every player pattern I had adopted, aka enter room, check every corner for items, find every hidden treasure, leave no stone unturned. I don't know if it was because of the immersiveness of this game at this point, which is undeniably spellbinding by the way, or the fact that the central story motivation of Metro's main character is incredibly relatable and important. Either way, I had entered a place where I was RTM. This really sums up my time with Metro Exodus, a ribbing game that I believe to be criminally underrated and one of the most immersive survival horror games I've ever played. Honestly, at times, I, I wish it was mostly, if not all, linear in the style of Metro Last Light, because I feel that's where Metro is at its best. But after I beat it, I reflected on everything I had done in the game, and while the open world elements were the moments that had faded from my memory the fastest, they actually made the overall game better for it. Truth be told, the hybrid open world of Metro Exodus needs to be acknowledged as being flat out tremendous for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's incredibly well integrated with the rest of the title. Metro Exodus is told as a one-year game in terms of seasons, and for the most part has four main maps that alternate between large and open and small and linear. And smushed around them are on-rail story missions and set pieces, and a train hub where you can hang out and chat with companions in between areas. Frankly, the combination is brilliant and such a welcome change from the here's a giant map with 500 icons and a fast travel system go nuts. While these games can be incredibly liberating in the sense that they give you what appears to be unlimited freedom, many end up being quite laborious and dull. And many of those games use the open world map as a distraction to pad out the game length because, well, a long video game is generally a great selling point. But in the end, every single open world game has a linear story hiding somewhere underneath it. It's only when you get past the window dressing and countless lookout towers and irrelevant side activities do you actually see it and get to play it. And normally it's quite gated forcing you often back into that giant open world sea of a map before opening up more to you later on. Or honestly, it's just poorly structured that the entire thing just becomes one long blur. This has caused many games to be more of a chore than they should be. Metro Exodus is not. For my money, the combination of open and linear is so refreshing, and even the way the game world is utilized is quite different. Without a mini-map, exploration is natural. You're not following a magic arrow in some tiny box in the bottom left corner of the screen, which can turn players into potato zombies as the beautiful scenery passes them by. In fact, the map actually works like an actual map. Players can't set waypoints, and the only way for icons to appear on the map is by discovering them with binoculars. So you have to actually look around and, you know, engage with the game world. Crazy, right? I know. Also important to note out is the small animation that plays out every time you open this map, which signals to the player, okay, this is a tool, not a crutch, as there's a minor cost to it, which is your time and your patience. After all, you can't walk with your map open and there's no auto run. So if you want to look at this thing, you've got to stop dead in your tracks and look at it, which is how maps work. Is that a fun gameplay mechanic? Most of the time, no, it's not. But in the right environments with the right game, absolutely. And this is one of those times for the sole reason that it draws you into the world you're actually exploring, getting players closer to the idea of actually being a hero instead of playing the hero. And there's no fast travel, and vehicle exploration is limited to a single map. This is one of the reasons why Metro Exodus feels so sprawling despite being fairly small. If you were to line up the Volga or the Caspian Sea, which are Metro's two open world maps, they would be dwarfed by any other AAA open world game. But does all that square footage actually matter? Does the game benefit from it? Or do they become less detailed and interesting the bigger and bigger and bigger they get? More importantly, the rewards you get by exploring and finding things are actually cool and interesting. We're talking about things like upgrades for weapons, safe houses, which are very important for a variety of reasons, or locations to complete side missions, which can affect relationships and the ending of the game. It's rare, if ever, that you'll go out of your way to explore something and not find something actually useful. Thus, while the game size is pretty small, 
Metro Exodus feels big, dense, and full of surprises, especially with its conservative stamina system. This allows players the motivation to move around the map organically, look around for landmarks, pause, interact with the map, and explore freely. This is a subtle yet very real departure from all the follow me quest arrows that have gained so much traction in these types of games for such a long time. Now obviously the Metro Exodus way does have some disadvantages for players that want a certain level of convenience and exploring, but with that I say you're playing the wrong game anyway. Metro is a purposeful, slow, heavy game and it has long animations for basic game interactions, and combining that with the lack of traditional accommodations for exploration, it makes for a game that requires patience. But it rarely if ever compromises on being a good game first in lieu of creating that immersive experience. The best example I can give is the difference between interacting animations and the looting animation. When players interact with anything in the game, from opening doors, jumping up a ledge, getting off a zip line, etc., there's typically a hefty animation that plays out, and the player is not able to move freely. It makes the game feel believable, as RTM only has, you know, two hands. He's a human being, so you feel this physicalness to the character. I know some people don't think that's really good for a video game, but for, like I said, the right video game, it is, and this is definitely one of them. However, there's no animation when looting. None. RTM just magically sucks up anything he looks at with the E button. Is that weird? Hmm, let's think about this for a second. To me, this is an obvious design choice that speaks to a game that understands the need to balance its immersive elements with the comfort of its players. Since players have to sit through countless animations when doing anything mandatory or story-driven, which adds to this immersion, but don't have to when doing anything optional, which offers relief and fluidity in gameplay and exploring, which, of course, subtracts from that immersion. There's a balance here. This tiny detail, I think, is incredibly important to bring up because it speaks to the thoughtfulness that was instilled into this title. A game that the developers knew was very physically heavy, ergo might be taxing on the player's patience. So they splice up what many gamers would consider mild tedium, with the gratification of instantly picking up all the cool shit that they want. This is critical because overall, Metro is a very slow, methodical game, but one that knows it probably shouldn't have that switch turned on all the time. I'm looking at you, Red Dead Redemption 2. It speaks to a very calculated duality, and that's what I love most about Metro Exodus. You almost feel like you're playing two different games here, depending on what moment you happen to be during the story. Personally, I think the gameplay really shines in the open world, and the immersion factor takes the cake during the linear portions. Metro Exodus has some of the most phenomenal atmospheric storytelling prowess in these moments. Long, haunting treks into bleak tunnels, run-down, decrepit cities and metros underground that Metro Last Lights was known for. Very cramped, claustrophobic environments. These sections are where Metro really won me over. In these areas, you have to battle your way past mutants with limited supplies and of course that horrible sense of dread and darkness that we all love about Metro. It just surrounds you, plodding through these radiated filled sewers, descending into the unknown giant caves that are so, so bleak and fighting through claustrophobic deserted bunkers. Working through them is so, as I said, atmospheric with the tight quarters, the heavy breathing, and the bevy of environmental sound effects and details, which there are so many. There's little things everywhere, like creepy little spiders that climb across your screen, which is your mask, or how you can wipe away the grime of your visor. It's those little tiny attention to detail things that make this game really special. Most of the gameplay scenarios in this environment are fantastic, especially when limited lights, scare tactics, and swarm-style enemy spawns are utilized. It's all brought together by a great upgrade system that rewards that exploration that I was talking about earlier, allowing players to find valuable parts to their kits around the map, like motion tracking add-ons and night vision goggles. RTM can also break down weapons in the field with his backpack, and use it to craft items in real time as well, which adds not only realism, of course, but tense feelings to encounters when you have to bust it out on the fly to make a syringe or a grenade. You know, something that's going to save your life because you're about to get swarmed and killed. The great part is these important items share resources with bullets, gas filters, and weapon care. So it's a subtle system of trade-offs with the limited resources of a dense pseudo open world, which really speaks to the theme of having to be a scavenger in an oppressive, horrible world that has just gone to shit. The actual gameplay itself is also very strong and thankfully the punch factor of the guns is at the Mike Tyson level. General gunplay feels incredible and all the guns have a very satisfying weight to them, which if I can be honest is one of the things that makes or breaks pretty much any FPS for me straight away. They even nailed the crossbow which has this awesome snappy sound effect straight from Crisis and killing someone with it just feels pretty damn good. 
There's a ton of other guns, my favorite being the rail gun, of course, which you can get towards the end of the game. Just make sure you don't fail to pick it up off the table, which you can do. Then the game just automatically saves and you can never get it back. So make sure you grab that thing. It hits like a freaking truck. Metro Exodus is the Burger King of gaming. You can have it your way. Bring in the guns you want with the upgrades you want. Do it how you want to do it. Whether it's stealthy, going balls to the wall Rambo style, or just being a tactician. You know, surveying the landscape, dissecting where the enemies are, making a route through it, you know, kind of Sam Fisher style. That's totally cool too. You can do whatever you want to do. The game gives you the freedom to approach it however you want to, and I love that. Outside some poorly designed mini bosses, both the game flow and the level design for these combat encounters, thumbs up, fantastic. One of the only problems I had with Metro Exodus, now that I think about it, is that the story isn't presented clear enough. While the story arcs the characters go through are great and very understandable, very relatable as well, especially with Artyom and Anna, and the entire we're a family thing on the Aurora, the actual minutia of the storytelling, pretty confusing. And the actual storytelling can be very long-winded and just, just too much. To be frank, I understood the general direction the game was going. RTM finds proof that there may be life outside the metro and now they're on a journey to find a new home and prove everybody wrong or whatever. But the exact happenings of who, what, where, and why pretty much fell in and out of my comprehension. Now, I'm no Einstein, but I'm not an idiot. I can follow a story if it's got holes as long as it's presented well and clear. But in Metro Exodus, I was constantly asking myself questions that I felt like the game should have explained better. Who the hell is this character? Where's the bad guy? In fact, who is the ultimate bad guy? Why did this happen? What's the deal with the government? Why are we going to this place? I get the meta-narrative, but the details in this regard, they're too confusing. Maybe I'm getting old and I'm dumb, but I just think there's too much dialogue in this game. I must have just tuned out during a moment of explanation early on, maybe? I tried to justify it this way, but the more I think about it, the more the game appears to fiddle with consolidating the amount of information it throws at you like Joe Montana, especially with the amount of context the game has to set up, which is fairly extreme, as there's two prior games early on. It also doesn't help that conversations and scenes are extremely overbearing. It's not uncommon for scenes to run over three to five minutes to obtain basic information, which partially is caused by some slow animation linkage. Unfortunately, the cinematography during these scenes, which I can best describe as staring at people through a window of a home, can be quite dry. What I'm trying to say is I think Metro asks a little bit too much from the player in terms of figuring out basic information, in terms of backstory knowledge, and just the sheer patience of soaking it all in. Because remember, this is a pretty short game, and it has a massive amount of stuff to say, which makes the finer game storytelling rather cumbersome. However, like I said earlier, the personal story arcs of RTM and his companions are excellent and very well done. I think Metro Exodus is one of the most underrated games, period. It has a magical, immersive quality to it, and boy does it look and play pretty. I feel like a predator when I play Metro, stalking my prey in the shadows. When I have to lock and load, the game makes me feel powerful and present, yet vulnerable and in need of a tactical mind and approach. A perfect combination for a survival horror game. There's an incredible amount of detail everywhere to be found, like hitting a ghoul in a car and watching him plaster to the bumper as blood sprays on the windshield. It's really cool stuff. It's got a perfect hybrid open world, where you always feel rewarded for going out of your way without it feeling oppressive. It feels big, real and bold, yet concentrated and dense. And it has a beautiful story, yet the particulars of it could have been presented in a cleaner, more simple way, and with more visual and interactive variety in that presentation. There's simply way too much come sit here and stare at me for five minutes while I ramble about something that could have been explained in 30 seconds, with average at best lip syncing. But despite that single flaw, I managed to find one of the best games released in 2019, and frankly one of my favorite new first person shooting adventure games. I've ever played. It's unfortunate that Metro had to have such a messy release, as I'm sure it turned off a ton of people. You know, I'm always going to want Metro to be confined to the cramped, horrible tunnels that made me so nervous, uncomfortable, scared, yet excited. But when I came up for air with Metro Exodus to the surface, I found that Metro games can be much more than those tunnels. They can be, in fact, incredible, immersive first-person shooters.